Good afternoon, everyone. I'll try again. Thank you. My name is Brandon Smith King, and I'm here to facilitate this awesome, wonderful girl power panel for everyone. A lot, we, we heard a lot last night at the banquet for those of you here, but today we get to hear our own grown Bermudian women talk about their experiences as student athletes and as parents of these wonderful, wonderful young women. So I will start when it's quiet. Sorry, I'm a teacher. So this afternoon we have three outstanding athletes with us with their mothers. And we want to make this a little interactive. I will read their very short bios so you get to get a full perspective of all the wonderful things they've done in the world of sports and athletics. I will propose some questions to them and also will welcome any follow-up comments or questions you all might have. Oh yes, of course. So with us today we have all kinds of wonderful people. How many of you were here last night? I want to make sure we didn't repeat a whole lot. Okay. And I want to thank the Women in Sport Committee for, and the Bermuda Olympic Association for putting on this wonderful event today. And um, I want to welcome our Minister for Youth and Sport. Thank you for being here again this evening. And we have lots of other distinguished guests here, all these young ladies up front. Yes? Here to learn. So we're going to start from your left to right. I'm going to introduce our panel. Okay, so we have on our far left, everybody knows Miss Katura Horton Parentif over here. Yes. Katura began diving at the age of five and was a Canadian national champion by the age of 15, which I didn't realize. Congratulations. That's awesome. 15, national champion. Where she swept all three events, which included what? Which three events? One meter, three meter, and the platform. One meter, three meter, and platform. You know the platform, the really high. Yes, I don't think I'd even walk up there. So that pretty, pretty, pretty amazing. Katora competed for Bermuda in two editions of the Commonwealth Games. Uh, she competed twice at the Pan American Games and several World Championships and World Cup Championships. In 2004, Katora became the first Black woman of any nation to compete in Olympic diving. Now, here we go. First black woman of any nation to compete in Olympic diving. What a, what a legacy to leave, to have. Katora is a proud graduate of the uh, unfortunate University of Texas Longhorn, sorry. And which is in Austin, Texas, is a wonderful university, wonderful campus for student athletes, where she received her bachelor's degree in French language and literature with a pre-med concentration. She's also a graduate of George Washington University and double, double majors in public health and business administration from George Washington. Two masters, not one, two. Katora currently manages Bermuda's National Cancer Registry under the Bermuda Hospitals Board and she founded the Star Diving Summer Camps in 2014 where she has been honored to teach over 350 kids. Any young ladies participate in the diving camp? You're going to have any ex-gymnasts? <laughs> Okay, you learn from the best. And next, Katora is her mother, Ellen Kate Horton, has been a mathematics teacher in our school system for many years. I do have a number of years here, but I won't say how many. Um, she's always been committed to education of Bermuda's youth. I know when I was coming up, she was always there. She was also the president of the Bermuda Union of Teachers and the vice president of the Caribbean Union of Teachers. What an honor. Of course, mom was also an outstanding athlete in her day, for those of you that are my age or around my age. Remember those days, the big blue machine? And that was an era in sports for women in this country that we should all be very proud of, and hopefully we can start teaching our young girls all about the big blue machine. And Ellen Kate was an awesome shortstop, and wherever she was needed on the field, bat, ball, she was there. She was our most, one of our most outstanding softball players. And um, it was really an honor for me to be working with them. And I have such great memories of them participating in the Pan Am Games and all those places we traveled. So that's Bermuda history. Okay. Um, she 
participate in the CAC games where they won a gold medal in softball, a feat that had not been accomplished by a Bermudian team until then, especially for women, and they were undefeated in that tournament. Where was that held? Medellin. Medellin, okay. She's a Bermuda Sports Hall of Fame inductee and enjoys gardening, tutoring, reading, coaching, diving, traveling, and also walking, because I see you walking sometimes <laughs> when I'm up in Dockyard. So welcome. And next to the... Uh, Next to the Hortons, we have Dominique and her mom, Tammy. Dominique Richardson was a top student athlete throughout her school days, having expressed interest in sports as early as six years old. Probably earlier than that, right? Because her mom, your mom was an athlete, so you know, you really didn't have a choice. She ended Francis Patton Primary School, Clearwater Middle School, and the Barclay Institute, playing multiple sports, including softball, track and field, basketball, netball, and football. Dominique started training with the under-21 national team, netball team, when she was only 12 years old. Imagine that, she's 12. And began playing football with the boys at the Hamilton Parish Hot Peppers Football Club before joining the Women's League at the age of 13. Nothing wrong with girls playing with boys. Actually, it's, it's kind of good for girls to play with boys because girls are usually faster, stronger, more flexible, and smarter. Girls! Before puberty. And that's just not my observation, that's been shown through research. Dominique was an honor student throughout her four years at Barclay Institute, you know, balancing both the academics and the athletics piece. Heavily involved in sports at the Barclay community, Dominique was captain of the netball, football, and basketball teams, and was also selected as head girl and gold house captain. No surprise, right? It was a great balance between academics and athletics. She has a master's degree, a bachelor's of science degree in business administration from Barry University with cum laude honors. That means, you know, she's just not an average student. She's a way above average student. She then went on to complete her master's degree in finance from Nottingham Trent University and received an academic scholarship from Belco, an NTU business school scholarship, and was also selected as a sports scholar for the 2014-2015 year. Dominique retired from football, boo-hoo, from Bermuda, and captained the senior national netball team in 2016. She still plays netball for the Phoenix Heat. And her mom, Tammy, began her teaching career <coughs> over 30 years ago, makes me really old, because I remember when you were a student, as a mathematics teacher. She has taught at Work Sec, now TNT Tatum. I always say Work Sec when I drive by, I'm still getting used to it. She taught at the Barclay Institute, and Cedar Bridge Academy. For the past 15 years, Tammy has worked at Bermuda College teaching mathematics. In August of 2016, she was appointed to her current role, the Dean of the Division of Arts and Science, which is really quite a, quite a position to have at the Bermuda College. So Tammy's learned, her daughter's learned from her to balance both the academic piece and the athletic piece. Athletically, Tammy played netball for the Nets for over 15 years. Her hobbies included netball, cycling, reading, and traveling and being a mom, right? <laughs> and last but not least, our star of the show here, Jessica Lewis, was introduced to wheelchair tra track racing in 2016 by her late coach, Ken Thom, and his son, Curtis. She began competing internationally in 2010. Jessica has represented Bermuda at two editions of the Paralympic Games in London in 2012 and Rio in 2016. She is the first wheelchair track racer to compete for Bermuda, and in 2015, she won the Parapan Pan Am Gold in the T5300 meter race, where she also set the game's record. She not only won, but she set the game's record. Quite an accomplishment. Wow. Later that year, in the same event, she won bronze at the IPC Athletics World Championships in Doha. Jessica is actively training for the upcoming 2019 Para Pan Am Games in Lima, Peru, and the 2020 Olympics uh, in Tokyo. And I'm going to figure out how I can stay in Lima a little extra time so I can see you compete, but I don't know if my job will give me any more time off, but keep up the good work and the training. Jessica also graduated from Brock University with a bachelor's degree in recreation and leisure studies in 2018. Jessica's mom, Lori, was born and raised in Bermuda, is a mother of two, and for 22 years, she and her sister, Karen, co-ran the Rosemont Guest Apartments, taken over from the parents, Barbara and Cyril Cooper, who opened the hotel 15, 18 years ago. 
Lori currently works at BHS, and her passion and encouraging nature, as we heard this afternoon in the wonderful demonstration, has not only fueled her own life, but has helped her daughters reach for the sky and achieve their goals. So we have an all-star panel here, and we want to welcome you, and thank you for taking time today to tell us about your experience. So I'm going to do this a little differently because rather than asking one question of everybody to answer, I'm going to mix it up. But feel free to jump in, and I might just throw this away, and we'll see where the conversation goes. So we want to try to make this a conversation. But I would like to start out um, as elite athletes. This is for the athletes. Um, when did it occur to you that you had something special, and why did you choose the sport that you chose? So we'll start with Jessica. Um, well, I've always been involved in so many different sports, thanks to um, Windreach Bermuda here. Um, so I was always just trying to find kind of people that were like me, because I was the only one um, growing up in my high school in a wheelchair. Um, so I never really had a lot of examples um, there until I got involved with Windreach. And it kind of just opened up my whole eyes to the world of para-sport. Um, so kind of going there, um, it really showed me that, you know what, I could be successful and I had kind of some abilities and I could be involved in sports, which has been a huge part of my life, obviously. Um, and so um, when I got introduced to track in 2006, um, I was still involved in so many other different sports, um, but I was fortunate to go and watch, uh, be a spectator at the 2008 Beijing Paralympic Games. And sitting there in the stands with my mom, um, watching wheelchair track, I knew that that was the sport for me. Um, I just loved how fast they could go, um, and I, I just wanted to have all of that kind of power and strength behind me that the athletes were showing. Um, so that definitely kind of opened up my eyes and, and made that decision for me. And we love seeing how fast you go around that track <laughs> up at National Stadium. I've seen you race. Um, me? And, for, and for me, it was a little different. So I grew up playing multiple sports. Um, and I guess when did I think I had something special? Um, I started playing netball when I was in primary school. Um, and when I was in P3 and P4, I was playing with the P6s. So that was kind of like the initial phase for me where I said, okay, maybe I'm pretty, pretty good at this sport. And then when I was asked to train with the under-21 national team at 12, that's when I, it kind of clicked in my head that, hey, this isn't normal. Like, you're the only 12-year-old <laughs> that's training with a bunch of 18- and 19-year-olds. Um, so that's when I realized I had something special with netball. And I didn't pick up football until I was about 12 or 13, um, playing with the boys, and then I was playing in the senior league with the women. And then Nikita, who was the under-17 coach at the time, asked me to train um, with the under-17s and the women. And then when I was 14, I was asked to travel with the senior women's national team to the NatWest Island Games in Greece. So I was 14 years old traveling with the women. Um, so I guess that's when, that's when I realized that, hey, I'm actually pretty good in football as well. Um, I can say that I ultimately chose a sport, so I found that I had more opportunities um, through football as far as getting um, scholarships in university, because um, I knew I wanted to go to the States, I didn't want to go to the UK, and I didn't want to go to Canada, so um, they don't play netball in the States, it's not that huge. So for a period of my life, I was very solely focused on football, and then once I kind of graduated and finished, Three knee surgeries later, um, I'm back to playing netball. So I can't say that I ultimately chose a sport, but it was definitely a mix of, of those two. I think there's a theme here. I think um, for me, I did every sport. And um, I was a major disappointment to my mother in softball because she used to... <laughs> She used to take me out back, and I was four years old, and she would throw the ball at me, and it would hit me in body parts that it wasn't supposed to hit me in, so we decided that was not my thing. So um, at around three-ish, I, I was doing cartwheels, like I was seeing somebody in the back doing cartwheels, and um, I ended up doing gymnastics for nine years. And uh, it was pretty funny because I, and I was doing diving at the same time. I started when I was five. So I, I started growing, though. And I love gymnastics. And the coaches said, you're not, you're not going to be amazing at this forever because you're getting taller. And as you guys know, gymnasts have to be itty-bitty. So it was sort of that 
I chose diving a little bit, but it also chose me. I, I was not going to be an, an Olympic gymnast, but um, diving was, it was my thing. And I loved flying through the air, and, and I loved beating people. <laughs> I love the competition, and um, that, that's definitely what drove me. She's fearless. Can you imagine going up on that platform? Okay. So can, I we all that, appreciate can I say that I'm not fearless? I'm not fearless. Well, and you know yeah. what? I, what I love telling my, my, uh, my camp kids is that being brave is a choice that you can wake up every single morning and make. And there's no such thing as a brave person. That is everybody in here. You can make a choice to be brave. So I was not fearless at all. I was afraid a lot of the time. But sometimes you got to get over those right. things that make you afraid, that make you scared, because it might open up doors that you never knew were Absolutely. there. Absolutely but you're still fearless. Um, so moms, um, I have a, kind of a dual question for you. Please share with all of us, number one, your, the sacrifices that you had to make as a parent um, and what it was like um, during that process to have a young female athlete in the house. What was that like for you? Um, I don't want to give away any, uh, any personal experiences, but just I know you do have them. So just share a few, and we'll start with Ellen Kate. Okay. Um, once we realized, uh, Couture did lots of sports as a, young, a youngster. We were living in Canada, because at the time her father was in school there. Um, and uh, many different sports, skating, swimming, everything you can ima imagine. But gymnastics took off, diving took off. Um, and it meant my driving literally every day, everywhere. Um, she's known to have supper on the road. We've homework on the road. She, we, once she became an elite diver, the uh, pool near to us couldn't accommodate her. So we had to drive across. If you know Canada, we're driving across the 401 in rush hour traffic. So we are like uh, two hours in traffic. So by the time she got home from school, it meant packing supper, putting her in the back of that car as I drove across that 401 for a couple of hours. And um, she ate supper there. She did homework there. This was the norm, like many days a week. I think it was only one day we didn't train. So for me, it was driving to every event, it, it, both gymnastics and diving. But diving took the major time because it was so far away. and. Um, it meant encouraging her. The days when she didn't want to go, I say, let's go. You know, it just, it just wasn't, uh, I'm not going today. Yes, we're going. And um, the other thing we did, I mean, I sat there and I watched her training. And so that kind of support you can give to your children just being there and they know you're there. And that was an everyday thing for me. Well, who was driving home? two hours to, you know, so I sat there. So nice. Tammy. Okay. Um, Dominique played many sports. So it was netball, it was football, it was basketball. So for every sport, she had training after school. She had national squad training. Every day of the week, she either had training for her school team or a national team or her club team. So it was a matter of me organizing, me being a single parent, organizing how she would get to training, of course, before she was 16. And then I would go home from my job, cook dinner, make sure dinner was ready for my son, and of course her, then drive back up to wherever she was training, um, watch her for a little while, and then bring her back home. So the same types of sacrifices where you have to be organized, um, and your children want to, you to be there even when you're training. So sometimes I would try to be there when she's training, but most of the time I had to leave work early to come home to prepare dinner and do those types of things. Weekends, your entire weekends are shot. And I know most of you parents here who have student athletes or athletes, your entire weekend is not yours. 
all day Saturday, all day Sunday, and mostly because she was just playing so many sports for such a long period of time. So, yeah, that would be my sacrifice. Thank you. Laurie. Yeah, I was the same, driving all over the island um, on Saturdays. Um, Jessica is extremely motivated, and on days where I thought she needed a break, I'd be the one saying, do you think you should skip practice today? And she's like, no way, no way. <laughs> so her late coach, Ken, um, he came to Bermuda in 2006. Uh, Windreach had a sports expo to show para sports. So Ken and his son Curtis um, that were two of the coach and athletes that came down. And Ken was the kind of person, he just wanted anybody in the sport and he would help anybody. And at the time, Jessica had been doing basketball at Windreach. But because Bermuda's so small, we, she had to look at an individual sport because Bermuda didn't have enough para-athletes to create a team. Um, so when she got in the chair, um, Ken was just like, you know, if you, want it, if you want to pursue this, I'm happy to coach you from afar. And, um, and he did. And then when we went, as she said, we went to Beijing. And I remember sitting in the stands and she said to me, she said, in 2012, London, I'm going to be on that track. I'm not going to be sitting in the stands. She came back to Bermuda and between Bermuda and uh, flying up to Canada. And um, then once she went to Brock, she was on the bus every weekend up to her coaches to train. And she did. She qualified and she was on that track in London. So um, this... I think Jessica's the one that made the sacrifices because she went away to university. She was away from her family. She's still living in Canada away from her family. We're an extremely close family. As, as you said in the bio, we owned Rosemont Guesthouse and um, my parents started it. My sister and I ran it. Um, and, you know, we're very lucky we have such a close family, but I think Jessica's the one that's making the sacrifices. I'm just so fortunate I get to tag along. Um, <laughs> to all these amazing events. Wonderful, thank you. So Jessica, I wasn't gonna ask the question, but I thought it would be important um, because for me, for all of us, you're, you're an athlete. It doesn't matter what event, what able on it to me is like, forget it. When I saw you were doing that little demo and you were going to speed limit, I'm like, hey girl, she's fast. So what I would like for you to talk about um, is how, in, when you were in college, how did you balance everything with your training and your studies and also being a para-athlete? Yeah, um, so one of the things that I always joked about with a lot of my professors or kind of my academic advisor was that I'm kind of on the extended version of a uh, degree here because my degree actually took me um, six and a half years to complete instead of the regular four. And that was just so that I could balance it all. Um, so I only took um, three credits a year, just enough to be a full-time student so that I was able to travel every weekend um, about two hours away to my coach's house every weekend um, so that I could train with him during the weekend and then I would train on my own at the school in my, uh, my little apartment. Um, on the roller, I was actually in a closet with my vacuum, so um, I did a lot of the training there. Um, so I was kind of, like I said, on the extended um, version of a degree, um, but all my professors were absolutely incredible and so supportive. Um, so it, I think if you're trying to find that balance, there is going to be people at the schools that are going to support you, um, because a lot of the schools, they do understand that, you know what, there is a lot in the world and, and you have to um, be able to have time to explore your gifts or be in a sport. Um, so I was very fortunate that way um, that they let me do that. And um, as part of my degree, I had to do a full-time internship as my last credit. So it was a 15-week um, internship. And um, usually uh, people complete that internship during the summer months. Um, but since my racing season is, is mainly in the summer, um, they let me do a fall internship. So it's definitely just about kind of advocating for yourself as well um, when you're trying to balance things and, and make sure that um, you know, you are successful in both of those things and not to try and stress yourself out um, and do take that, that downtime when you need it. Thank you. Can you imagine? What was it like in the wintertime? Horrible. <laughs> it's still horrible. <laughs> I mean, I know, I used to, you know, ice and snow and all that we dealt with and, you know, you have extra things to think about, you know, so kudos to you for your commitment. I can see mom, you've, you've just followed her around, right? Yeah. <laughs> So, um, Ms. Dominique, uh, you went to university in the U.S., um, and I did ask this question yesterday, but I, 
I'm going to ask it again. Um, talk to your, our young people about the uh, experience you had as a student athlete and all the sacrifices you had to make being on a varsity team. Um, perhaps wanted to do the dancing thing. I don't know. I don't know you that well. Um, talk about that experience. I know there's a lot you can chat about, but pick some of the highlights for you as being a student athlete through your, from your freshman through your senior year, how you learned to juggle all that. So my story is a little bit different. Um, I didn't actually play college um, football until my junior year officially. So I had two ACL surgeries in my senior year of high school and one in my first year of college. So that kind of ruled me out of a lot of athletic scholarships. And from when I was six, in my head, athletic scholarship, my mama isn't paying for anything. I'm going to go on a full ride. I'm going to go play football. And that was my complete mentality. Luckily, I was a good student in primary, middle, and high school, and I had the grades to apply for academic scholarships, and that's what, that's what actually funded my education. Um, I've won, in total, about $160,000 in academic scholarships um, and about fifteen in athletic. So growing up, it, I thought it was going to be the complete opposite, <laughs> um, just playing all these sports and just the success I was having with the national teams and traveling. So um, the academics is just as important, if not more important, than the athletics as well. Um, but in college, I had my first year and a half, I was just a student. So I got to have a bit of the party life at first, and I went to school in Miami. So um, that was amazing. But, you know, I, I wanted more. I, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm the most outgoing or the party type, but... Um, I definitely wanted to be an athlete. I saw the team play. I went to every game. I knew I had what it took. Um, so I tried out twice, um, was, su was successful the second time, and I ended up being a walk-on on the team. And the following year, I got a scholarship, and I was actually a starter for my last two years when I played. And balancing sports and academics is tough. I'm not going to lie. Um, we trained every day from 4 to 6.30, and we had games Fridays and Saturdays. So often we might have had one day off and you still have to attend classes during the day you have to make up the classes that you miss for away games you have to check in with your professors um, but luckily for me I had a good relationship with my professors and that was key for me I went to a smaller university so my classes were about 30 students so my professors knew me by name they understood you know I could sometimes you know cheat a little bit and just be like look I can't make this class today. And they say, you know what, don't say anything. I'll send you the notes. Um, so having that rapport with your professors is key. And also, as a student athlete, they have a lot of resources for you at these universities. They understand that you're an athlete. They understand your training every day. And they provide you with a lot of additional resources um, if you need it. You also have to maintain a certain GPA. I mean, being a student athlete is tough. I know it sounds amazing and everybody you know, wants to be one and wants to do it, but you really have to sacrifice a lot. Those last two years, and that's when I went 21, by the way. So I was 21 and still a student athlete, but I sacrificed a lot of the, you know, the Miami lifestyle, South Beach, you know, I gave a lot of that up so that I could pursue my career or my athletic career um, at Barry, playing football and, and doing that type of stuff. So it's tough. <laughs> it is. So I know you're chomping at the bit over there, Miss Couture. Your question's a little different, but you can comment on that can I as well. That and I'll ask you the question. Can yeah. you retain the question first before I forget it? I'll, I'll do that one first. Okay. <laughs> I did not go to a small university. The University of Texas um, is one of the largest universities in the nation, so I was one of 600 people in a classroom sometimes. And, uh, yeah, no, they, they didn't know me. Um, <laughs> And perhaps the, the funny thing is, you know, you, you know me now, but um, I, I was not anything or anybody special to uh, the recruiting staff at the University of Texas. They did not scout me. They did not recruit me. Um, and uh, there were eight other schools that did scout me and did recruit me. Um, and I remember I was uh, 17 years old and Duke University called me and said, um, we're going to offer you a full scholarship, um, which of course Duke is, is Ivy League. And uh, I wanted to be a doctor at the time. And I said to my mom, you know, I, I, I should probably tell these people I'm coming to Duke. You know, you don't have to pay anything. And 
She said, but what, what do you want? And I said, I, I, want, I want to be a doctor and I, I want the Olympic Games. And she said, you can be a doctor later. The Olympic Games is not going to be there forever. Um, you cannot go to the Olympics when you're 40. It's not going to happen. So um, the University of Texas offered me books. And uh, these parents will know that books cost about $600. Um, and uh, then you got to pay tuition and you got to pay room and board. But the University of Texas at the time had the number one diver in the world. She was the current Olympic champion on the platform. And uh, I was going in as the second worst on the team. And I think for me, it was knowing that there were going to be people in the pool who were better than I was. And you know what? If you want to be good, you surround yourself with people who do what you do. But if you want to become great, you surround yourself with people who do what you do better than you do it. You don't ever want to be the best one in the pool. So I got there. I went to Texas. My mother was not happy about the choice of Texas. As you know, as a person of color, the southern United States was very tough. Uh, for a mother to send her kid away to. Um, so she was not happy. But we went there, we met the coach, Matt Scoggin, who was the number one diving coach in the nation, who said, listen, your kid is safe with me, I will keep her safe. And if she wins me a conference medal, I'll give her a full scholarship. So as a freshman, I won Big 12s. I won a, a silver medal on the platform. And uh, I was at the time, a freshman was pretty amazing. And uh, I got, I got my, my full ride. So she didn't have to pay any more than that first semester. And um, thank goodness, because she was working her butt off over here. And I was as well, obviously, to get that scholarship. I'm coming back to the second question, because I want to go right to Ellen Kate. Um, because I see how the moms and the daughters are looking at each other, right? You have the we have the secret language with our daughters. Okay, so all the moms here, there is a secret language. Alan Kay, tell us about your relationship with Katora. You know, as she was developing as an athlete and becoming an elite athlete and to where you are now. I think there's an important story in that. Yeah. Um, I guess important to mention is that by the time she was 11... I was going to come back home and uh, put her at the Barclay, you know, where I had been, and you realize you've got something special on your hand. I actually moved home and um, through the summer made the decision, I can't take this from this child. She was winning medals, she was doing well, and this was her niche. So I said, okay, so I make the sacrifice, I went back to Canada. And, um, you know, the rest is history. But we, we sacrificed in that we were there. But Katura did her part. Once she got to Texas, and, and she's right about that. I was saying, I am not sending this little black girl to Texas. <laughs> they just dragged a young man behind a truck. And as a mom, and that's all I have. This is it. Um, I was fearful, but I felt, you know, to talk about the Duke thing when we said no, I said, you can't be bullied into a place like that. And so we said no. Yes, we were saying no to Ivy League, but there was Columbia who had said yes to her. But however, when we went down to Texas and met Max Scoggin, he was awesome. He brought, and, and you know, it was important that she and I were on the same page because I had to be her advocate wherever she was. Did you hear and, that, parents? You know, to, Coaches? To the point where when she got to Texas and they thought athlete, they didn't want her to do her physics classes, and, you know, she calls me mom. They don't want me to do physics. I said, I'll be there. <laughs> Fly I'm sure to you Texas. were. <laughs> Fly to Texas and my child can do physics. <laughs> you know, so those fights you have to make and you have to do it. She needed the support. I was there to give it. And uh, I had lived my life by that time. And so it was important. And uh, Matt had 
a child whom he had adopted. She was not white, and he had protected her. I knew he would do it for Keturah, and he was the best ever coach. Can, can I say one thing? So we didn't, we were not always this close. And, and I don't know if that's what uh, you were getting at, but yes. you know, every single mall excursion, movie excursion, party that she said I could not go to because I had practice at six in the morning, I, I won't say hated her for it, but did not have very many nice things to think about, right? <laughs> but that dream was our dream. And it was a dream that I, at 15, 14, wanted, but didn't know how to get it. So to all the little girls in the room, I hope you know that your mom is your best friend. She may not feel that way right now, but at yeah. some point, you're going to look back on your life and say, when I couldn't, she did. When I didn't want to, she pushed. And, and that's, that's the, the lesson that I hope that you're getting from all of us up here. You know, we're, we're great with our moms now. <laughs> But at the time, it's tough, and it's not just a, 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 an us sacrifice. It's, it's a parental sacrifice, Absolutely. too. Absolutely. Just because this is so important, I want to hear from Lori and Tammy. Lori, you want to share about that, your relationship with your daughter? Well, I mean, our, ours was a completely different story because uh, Jessica was born two months early. Um, she only weighed three and a half pounds. And uh, we didn't know that she had a problem with her spine until she was born and she had a skin tag on her back. And um, it's a long story, but um, I, I was sick. I was blind. So my poor mother was there with this because um, I have a, an older daughter. So I had a three-year-old and then I had this baby that had this uh, spine problem. I was blind. My poor mother is like, is, am I going to get my sight back to be able to look after these two little girls? Fortunately, I did. Um, but... It was, you know, when, when I got my sight back and I realized, I was comprehending that I now had this, this child with a disability, I was like, what do I do with her? You know, we're, we're in a place that still, 25 years later, we are still fighting for accessibility. And it was, it was traumatic. Like, what, what are we going to do with this little girl? And it was Jessica that showed us what we were going to do with this little girl. We were at Children's Hospital. She had surgery. She, was, she had every complication. She was on her tummy for 56 days because the dura around her spinal cord wouldn't seal. My mother was an uh, operating room nurse, and in her head she was thinking, oh, my gosh, are we going to be able to take this child out of the hospital, or is she going to have to be, live in a hospital because spinal fluid was just leaking and leaking. Fortunately, the amazing doctors at Boston Children's did drastic yeah, things Boston and children. got the spinal cord sealed. Um, Jessica got her first wheelchair at 19 months old and I remember again my wonderful mother was there with us and we were there with the gentleman from the wheelchair place. Her occupational therapist was there. There was all these people there and we put this tiny little girl in this little wheelchair with 12 inch wheels and we put her in it and she sat there and crossed her arms. And uh, so everybody left and just left my mother and Jessica and I, and we went out in the hallway, and I put my hands on her, on her hands on the wheels, and I pushed her hands twice, and off she went down the hallway. She got to the end of the hallway, and she was at a door. So she kind of turned around and looked at my mother and I, and we said, turn around. And she sat there, and she fiddled for about five minutes and turned this wheelchair around and had the biggest smile on her face, and she has not stopped since. So, <laughs> so she did all kinds of sports. She, was, she did horseback riding at Windreach. She was doing basketball. She was doing wheelchair tennis down with Paul Alves at Grotter Bay. She was doing rock climbing at BHS. And then one day she turned to me, she was probably about eight years old. She said, Mommy, I want to try volleyball. And I said, you can't do volleyball. <laughs> And she's like, why not? I said, because we don't have time. There you go. Why not? No this is a way to switch the narrative. Why not? Yep. So, um, Tammy, tell us your okay. story. Okay, so um, Dominique, as a baby, was very clingy. She was, like, always on my hip from a young little girl. But um, many people don't know this. When I was six years old, my mom had seven children, 
and my mom was 39 years old. I was the second youngest, the oldest was 17, and my mom had a stroke, a very severe stroke. She, um, I remember the ambulance coming to our house and thinking that my mom was gonna come back home. My mom never came back home. She was hospitalized for over 40 years before she passed three years ago. So for me, having Dominique, and my life, I never had a mom. I didn't have many memories of my mom. I was you know, in different homes, so she was a gift to me. Every time I looked at her, I wanted to be the best example of a mother to her because I didn't have that. So it was very easy mothering her. She's never ever had spanks or licks, and I'm, <laughs> and I'm not lying. She was a really good child, but throughout her life, she controlled what she wanted to do. I was just on the sideline and preparing the resources and making sure she got what she needed for whatever she wanted. I never dreamed she would play football ever in life. I remember the first football game in St. David's. She was playing with the boys. I was sitting in my car by myself, and it was this little girl just chasing the ball. She was horrible, <laughs> horrible. She was, yeah, she says she was trash. But when she got in the car, you know, she was like, how did I do, mommy? And you know, us mommies, what we do. Oh, I said, you were really good, Dominique. I said, but certain things you need to work on. You know, I always give the positive and then the negative. So, you know, it's a few things you need to work on. But for Dominique, she was always looking for feedback after every game and after every training session. So I would start out with the positives, but I was also very honest with her when it came to being critical of certain things that she needed to improve on. But when it came to her academics, I realized that because of the tight training schedule, sometimes she would get home at nine o'clock at night and have homework to do. So as a mother, I try to be as supportive, I know some of you can relate to that, as supportive as I can. I remember one night we got home like 9.30 and she looked in her agenda and said, oh mommy, I have a report to do and it's due tomorrow. Um, no, we were driving home from training and she said, I have a report to do, it's due tomorrow. I said, oh dear, what is it on? She said, on, what is it, of mice and men. I said, okay, have you read the book? I didn't get to finish the book, I only got like a third way through. I said, okay, well, I can write a note to the teacher and tell her that, because, you know, circumstances. No, I have to get this report done. She was the type of student, she didn't want any excuses. If it was due, she wanted to have it done. So as a mother, talking about being an advocate, I thought real quick, let's stop it. Remember phase one? The video store <laughs> by the apothecary? I said, we're gonna rent that video. <laughs> We're going to go home, I'm going to sit in the living room with you, and we're going to watch that video. And that's what we did. And we, I stayed up with her at the kitchen table until midnight, until she finished that report, because I knew she was tired. I was bored to death, yes. <laughs> I was sitting there, but it's all about supporting them in whatever they need and being advocates for them when they're in those trials and tribulations and know when to say, okay, let me take over. I will help you get through this little period. Yeah. Wonderful. I mean, I could, we could do this all day. But I have, I have one question I'm going to combine for, for the student athletes. Is, um, tell us all about, you know, some of the challenges you had, the ch challenges you faced as, as an athlete, and what did you learn from that, and what are you most proud of? Jessica? Um, I think the biggest challenge for me that I still face is just um, being away from my family so much. Like my mom said, you know, we're such an extremely, extremely close family. Um, and it's, it's pretty tough for me to be away and, and kind of see, you know, on our family chat, oh, we're going to dinner here or something like that. Um, but I, I think that I have such an incredible, incredible support team with my family that, you know, they all 
completely understand that I have to be somewhere where I can get the most optimal training. Um, so having, like, like everyone has said here, that incredible support behind me and that understanding that, you know what, this is a dream that I have and it's something that they all believe in as well as me and kind of help me get up in the morning and say, you know what, I have to be here to do this. And, and on those tough days when, you know, I, I just want to give up everything and, and come home, you know, they remind me of, you know, how far I've come and how far I still can go in this sport and, and just kind of all the um, great things that the sport has taught me and, and how it's helped me be comfortable with who I am as a person and, and accept that I have a disability and I'm in a wheelchair. Um, so just having that constant reminder from my family and, and um, a lot of the times they do come up and surprise me, which makes it a lot easier um, uh, on me as well. So again, just that incredible support. Sure. Um, and also, um, I think coaches play a huge part in an athlete's life. Um, I keep saying Jessica's late coach, Ken, um, he passed away very suddenly in September of 2017, um, which was absolutely devastating to Jessica and his other athletes. Um, but a coach... They need to know every single thing that's going on with an athlete so they know when they come to training if they've got a headache or they're just not feeling it that day. And, you know, the coaches are key to an athlete's um, success. And, you know, we thank Ken every day and now his son, Curtis, who was a racer for Canada for 20 years. Curtis has thankfully retired, well, not thankfully, he retired from racing and now has taken on Jessica as, as a coach. So, but um, kudos to all the coaches out there because uh, you are a huge part of an athlete's success. Is it Tammy? I mean, um, and challenges for me. So I briefly spoke about, um, oh, I've had three knee surgeries, but the first two happened at very critical times in my life, especially when I was looking to play, university, um, play sports in university. So I, in my senior year of high school, I reached out to the BFA. I said, you know, I, at this time, they didn't send teams to go play in college tournaments. Scouts were not coming to Bermuda to look for, for student athletes. So I kind of had to create my own opportunity. So we wrote the BFA, um, asked them to sponsor me, to send me to a few college tournaments to play as a guest player. Unlike random teams, had no idea who they were, didn't know the people. But I played in two college tournaments, one in November and one in December. And I actually got um, about four offers from different um, coaches from different universities. So at that point, I'm like, okay, athletic scholarship done. She don't have to pay nothing. I just have to pick which school I want to go to. That following April, I tore my ACL. So that ruled me out of my first year of playing college sports um, as a freshman. And it, no college coach is going to sign or give a full scholarship to someone who pretty much can't even play their entire first year. So I ended up going to Barry University, watched them play, knew I had what it took to, to make that team. Um, and then I actually tried out in the spring season. And I didn't prepare. I didn't train. I was... I had the Bermuda mindset that I was a big fish in a small pond. And then when I went to try out, I noticed that everybody around me was just as good or better than me. So I didn't train. I wasn't fit. My knee wasn't fully healed. Um, I couldn't even finish the tryout. So first impression of the coach, psh, we're not worrying about her. So before I left um, for summer, I went back to the coach. I was nagging him. I said, look, I'm good. My trial wasn't great. I know I have what it takes. So the coach told me, Take this summer to get, to get fit, take this fitness packet, and you can come back for preseason and try out. So the entire summer, waking up 5 a.m., training, going to National Stadium, doing, you know, different types of circuits. I was training twice a day while also working. I was a, um, I worked in the summer day camp, so I was out in the sun all day. I was exhausted. I was training with the national team at the time. Um, a Canadian college was actually coming down to play the Bermuda national team. And four days before I was due to fly back to Barry University for my trials, I tear my ACL again. And I can honestly say, like, that broke me. Like, I contemplated not even playing again. Like, I, I'm, I'm going to quit. You know, maybe it's just not meant for me. And my whole time from when I first started playing at 10, I was like, I'm going to play college football. So, you know, for all that time, that's all I had in my head. And then here I am suffering this second ACL surgery, and I'm just like, 
I don't know, it, it was a very dark time, and this is where she was key, because I wouldn't have been able to do half the things I have without her support, without her encouragement. Um, she believed in me when I didn't believe in myself. And that second surgery, I don't know what happened, but within four months, she doesn't know this, within four months, I was back on a football field. So I took... <laughs> hey, we're learning a lot about this stuff here. <laughs> so I took... <laughs> I took, phys I took physical therapy into my own hands. You know, we found a place in Miami. I had to catch a taxi three times a week to go physio because I wasn't a student athlete, so I couldn't use the facilities at the university. So it was all on me. I, mornings, I would train. Afternoons, I would go physio. And then the following um, spring season, I tried out. I made the team. Um, I made the team for the spring season, and then the following semester, I was a starter. And I was a two-time... Well, I started for my junior and senior year. So I think that was one of my greatest challenges, but also one of my greatest accomplishments, like actually finally making that team and actually being a starter on that team. So. Wonderful. Okay, ma'am. What I am most proud of yeah. is um, being able to be a role model for young girls. And it's something that I always had in my mother and in, I always talk about Debbie Jones Hunter because uh, she's an incredible Bermudian advocate for sport that I grew up knowing about, even though she was a little before my time. Um, my challenge was that I was the only person who looked like me in a sport that uh, was not accepting of that. Um, and it's, it's a pretty emotional journey for me because, whoa, that was my, that was my question earlier. Yeah, um, you know, um, knowing that you're is something that my mother taught me early. Um, and day after day, judges let me know that I wasn't, I wasn't good enough. And, um, <laughs> okay. No, I got this. So... I just think of the fact that I'm, I was an incredible diver always. And um, even though it wasn't rewarded early, over time, the judges and the diving world got used to this being the face of excellence. Right. And my mother did that. You know, um, so now when little black girls go to the Olympics and diving, they know that they did not have to break that barrier. That barrier is crushed. And I love that I've always had the support of Bermuda, of Bermudians, even though I didn't grow up here. This is home. These are my family. And... Um, you know, it's just been an incredible journey that I never would have made it through without the support of, I mean, a country, a nation, and this woman who has been there. I'm 36 years old, and I said, I want to start a diving camp. And she said, I'll coach. And this was someone who knew nothing about diving, nothing about diving, and, and got to the point where she was a FINA certified judge a CADA certified coach. So she took that on. She took that on and it was the two of us and we were all the time making this Olympic dream a reality. So, you know, yeah, that was a challenge and it was a sacrifice. But, you know, as time went on, those sacrifices were to make this sporting world and this is, this is a woman's sacrifice too, to make this, this sacrifice a little bit easier for the girls who come behind us. You know, this is not, this is what we're here for. So that all the stuff that we had to go through, y'all don't have to go through, because we've right. already done it. Let me say something. Thank you. Go ahead. I, I just want to add to that. I, I didn't need to make She you got cry. a little soft on me today. <laughs> but I, I just want to add that throughout her, growing years. I mean, 
One of the reasons I went back to Canada was because there was no facility here. But I will tell you, this little girl talked to every Bermuda premier on the way up because we returned to Bermuda every summer and we made a track down to the cabinet office and we talked to anybody who was in the seat of premier. And, you know, at that time it was the, the David Soul she spoke with, she spoke with Pam Gordon, um, you know, and they were accepting and Pam was the one who said, okay, Couture, we're gonna get you a pool. And that's when it started. So, you know, the fact that that is up there started with every day, you know, every time we were here, going down to speak, and she was adamant about it. You know, so. so because we're running out of time, um, and I want to give everybody an opportunity to, to speak, I, I want to propose a question to the mothers first and then the daughters. And then if we have time, if there's anything else you'd like to share or have some questions, but I really feel like this question is important. For, for, so for the moms, it's the night before the Olympics, all the world championships, or national soccer game up at uh, National Stadium, or national championship, or whatever it might be, you're in the stands, how do you feel? Um, I think I'm more nervous than she is. Um, it's just pride. When, um, when she went to London, um, one of the things that you have to do, because um, Jessica was Bermuda's only athlete in London, so I was fortunate I was able to go as the chef de mission. So one of the things you have to do is you have to get your uniforms all checked. So they go over them with a fine tooth comb, and if your logo's not right, you can't use it and, and everything. And so I had been and had the uniforms checked, and they told us, yes, everything was fine. They, we, we had, for our opening ceremony, we wore a Bermuda scarf, and the um, artist who designed the scarf, her signature was in the corner. And they were picking on that, saying we had to duct tape over that because, you know, people sitting in the stands were going to see a signature this big. But anyway, we got that all done and everything. So we're sitting in the stands, and her first race was the 100 meter. And... <laughs> And we're all there and we're all nervous and, you know, out the athletes come out of the tunnel onto the track and, you know, there was eight of them in the race and seven of them come out and no Jessica. And we're sitting there going, where is she? What happened? And Ken, the coach, said, I dropped her off in the right place. Everything was fine. She was there. And the other athletes are doing their lap and they're up around. They've probably done 200 meters to come around to get into the start line and still no Jessica. And we're going, oh, my God. I'm like, well, something must have been wrong with her uniform. They're not going to let her race and everything. And then the other athletes are over at like 300 meters and out comes little tiny 65 pound Jessica onto the track at the London Stadium that was holding 80,000 people. And out she comes and she just wheels all by herself around and came and got on the start line and she was eighth in the race and we were just all over the moon. So after, you know, we went to her going, what the heck happened? Where were you? And uh, I'll let her tell you. I was um, wearing a jacket in the call room, and when I came out, um, we were all taking our jackets off and handing it to the officials, and I got the jacket off halfway off, and then it got stuck on my glove on the other side. So I was trying to get my jacket off, struggling with this, sitting in my chair, and finally an official came running over to help me. So <laughs> everyone went out as I was struggling with my jacket. Watch the jackets. Yep. So we, we laugh about that all the time now when we're sitting at a race and she comes out. We're like, okay, good. Yeah. Thank you. Tammy? Okay, for me, of, of course I'm very proud and I'm nervous. But I think every time I saw her play, especially after those knee surgeries, I was so nervous that she was going to injure herself again. Every little fall, every little wrong turn, if somebody bumped her or knocked her off her feet, I was like cringing and saying, please, Lord, do not let my child have another serious injury. So I was extremely nervous, but at the same time, extremely proud and happy for her that she was still, you know, doing something that she really loved. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and I'm a little different. Not nervous at all. Um, my, my thing was, uh, as long as she could handle and understood what 
the fact that she wasn't going to get the eight and a halfs, even if the uh, dive was an eight and a half, um, she would get the six and a halfs. You know, she understood that. Um, we knew she was better than that. It, it showed when we went to Europe and she, threw, she blew away the competition in Europe where when she was home, we weren't having that. The same thing happened in Cuba when she dove there because she was jerk, judged. Her dive was judged, not, you know, in, uh -huh. instead of judging her, her dive was judged. So at the Olympic Games, actually, you know, here we are in Greece and Katura got sick. And I'm saying, oh no, girl. So, and some of you may not know, and I was so angry with Bermuda at this time, because we sent two girls to those Olympic Games, and we didn't send one female with them. So, um, I was there as the mom, you know? So I had to get Mr. Gishad at the time to let me, get them to let me into that village to take care of this sick athlete. Um, because both the girls had male coaches, there was no female there. And I just said, I hope Bermuda never does this again. Fortunately, I was there, so I spent some time in the village nursing her. But guess what? When that closing time came, I had to leave. So you're leaving a sick person and you're hoping. But by the time Olympic Day came, you know, so she missed a couple of trainings. And when we actually got to the site, and I sat there and saw her come out on the, and she was diver number one. She, I'm saying, oh dear, don't miss it. And, uh, but I was confident, you know, I didn't, I didn't get upset or anything like that. That wasn't me, though. That's not my style. So she did that first dive, and she nailed it. I say, you go, girl. Right. And um, it was wonderful. It was a proud, proud moment. And as we walked around Greece afterwards, the little people knew that she had, that there was a piece of history. And they would run up to her, can I have your autograph? All the other divers were walking by and they wanted her <laughs> autograph. So it, it was a good time. Right. So my last question, um, similar for the, for the athletes is, um, you know, it's the night before your competition, you're getting your uniform together, you're having a team meeting or your last little whatever you need to do to prepare yourself. And then you get up the next morning or whenever your competition is, you take that jersey out of the bag and it says Bermuda on it. Tell us how that feels. Tell these young girls how that feels. You put that Bermuda jersey. It's, it's the feeling of a lifetime. Or Simpson, you know, I, sorry. I think of, no, well, you know what? My most memorable Olympic moment, other than uh, my first dive, was uh, walking into that Olympic stadium with Bermuda on my back, you know, uh, with, with the crowds yelling, Bermuda, Bermuda, and we're just waving. And I mean, we're in Greece. So, so there's no reason that they, they should be supporting Bermuda, but they are. And, and knowing that 64,000 people at home are, are so proud anyway. You know, it doesn't matter how you, how you do, you're there and it's amazing. But, you know, I was sick before my meet. So she wasn't nervous, but I was nervous. I had missed, you know, for diving, it's, it's a constant repetition thing. So you miss a meet and it, it, it takes you off your game. You miss a, a practice, it takes you off your game. So I was uh, two days without being in the pool at all and then just, here we are on Olympic day. And so a lot of that stuff, I, I just had to trust the training and be like, I, I have this, I have muscle memory, I can do this, it'll be fine. But you know, I, the overwhelming feeling for me was pride. It was pride. Having Bermuda on my chest, it was my, my bright blue Speedo, Bermuda in bright yellow. And uh, you know, I looked up on the, the NBC station and you're not supposed to watch the TV when you're on it. FYI, and um, I looked right in there and I waved, and then I, I did my dive. 
Great. Great <laughs> and story. that was that. Great story. Thank you. And Don't Sam, me. for me, it was pride. Um, never in a million years did I think I was going to play on the national team for football. It was always um, in my head for netball because I had started so young. But, you know, traveling with the national team to, you know, multiple different countries and just being able to represent such a small island, I just thought that that was so amazing. And when I went to Barry and I told my teammates, I was like, yeah, I'm on my national team, just to see their reactions, because I had teammates from Brazil, from Finland, from Sweden, so like big major countries. And I think in their head, they're thinking at it from their perspective, like, wow, like if I was on my national team, you know, how amazing would that be? So to see the reaction of others, but also that Bermudian pride and to put on a, a Bermuda Football Association jersey or even like the Nepal team, you know, I was center and center starts the game off. So for me, during the day, I'm fine. You know, I'll wake up, I'll have breakfast, kind of casually go. Even in the changing room, I'm fine, you know, calm, listen to my music. But the minute you're in the tunnel and like you see Jamaica coming out or you see Trinidad coming out, something just clicks. And I'm just like, I don't know, like Hulk. And... <laughs> And like that's for me when I just kind of switch into like game mood and it's just like a different person comes out. I get to express myself in a different way. I just get to really do something that I love. And I can honestly say that like sports in general is my passion. And that definitely shows when I'm representing Bermuda, when I play with my league team, like I'm playing today and it's the same thing. Like I, I step on the court, Miss Otis is an umpire, poor sight. And <laughs> but you know, it comes out every time I step on a court. So the pregame, not so much, but the minute, you know, it, it's game time, something just clicks. Thank you. And Jessica? Definitely for me, it's, it's so prideful to be able to have Bermuda on my back. And one of the, probably my most favorite experience um, was when we were heading to um, the London 2012 um, Paralympic Stadium. And, um, we, you know, we were all lined up in all the different different uh, countries and um, you could just hear like the roar of the crowd it's kind of like when you watch like a football game on TV and you just hear that chant and you could hear that and it that kind of that moment it hit me that you know what this is something that's so big and coming from such a small island it's so phenomenal that you know we can produce greatness and it's it's something that you know we all work hard to do and we have such amazing, amazing support on our tiny little island to get us to these places. And um, one of the big things that uh, I noticed too going to these big games is that the Bermuda shorts are very, very well known um, around. And and uh, I remember um, one of my great memories with uh, my coach, Ken, um, when, uh, you know, we said that we wanted to go to these games and we said, oh, you're going to have to be in some Bermuda shorts. And he's like, oh, goodness me. Like, he wasn't too thrilled about it at the beginning. Um, and as soon as we got to London and he put the shorts on, he had so many people coming up, you know, young women as well, coming up to him and, and wanting to take pictures with him. And he just had the biggest grin. And I just remember talking to him after and I said, so the Bermuda shorts are pretty good, aren't they? And he's like, they pretty are. <laughs> so, um, and then, you know, entering that stadium with those 80,000 people there and you know I was very fortunate that I was the flag bearer as well and and just an incredible incredible feeling that is so incredibly hard to explain um, but just definitely so so much pride thank you so I know you, if you have any questions they're going to hang around for a few minutes but as Jessica said this is greatness yes sure. good afternoon um I actually don't have a question, but I would like to thank all of you guys, um, especially you growing up in Canada. I bet you had the opportunity. You could have represented them, but you chose us, um, and you chose to carry. Yeah. Clap for. Somebody was clapping? Yeah. Yes. You, you chose to carry this island on, on your shoulders, so thank you. If you've ever had the opportunity to be around a coach, Dominique, she's a coach's dream. So when we, win, when we make it to the 2022 World Cup, hopefully by then she'll have changed her mind. Or maybe we'll just carry along as an, amb as an ambassador for the sport and, and as well as the country. Um, but um, this, is, this is fantastic. Um, Jessica, um, you have shown today, I know you've shown my girls that you don't focus on what you can do, but you spend more time on doing what you can. And, you know, it's, this has just been a fantastic, fantastic event. And I want to thank you panelists. Um, and thank you mothers because it is tough. Um, 
I spend a lot of time in football and I understand what that sacrifice is about. And, you know, thank you, young ladies, um, for giving back to our country and carrying this little small island on your back and putting us on the map. So thank you. Thank you, Coach. Very well said. Um, so thank you, ladies. We, had, we saw a lot of girl and woman power here this past day and a half. And the greatness is within us. And the champion is within us. And my goal is for all these little girls that are still here, young ladies, that you'll pursue whatever it is in life you want to do and just go for it. And just as, you, as we talked about, when those barriers are there, you find a way to whoop, hop over them, go under them, knock them down, and do your thing. So thank you very much. And um, we'll do this again. Thank you.